Okay, so chapter 17 is about electric potential and electrical energy. Um, let's try and relate this to you in terms of gravity. So let's say we have an object above the ground. So the higher we raise this object above the ground, the more gravitational potential energy that it has. And of course, that gravitational potential energy could be turned into kinetic energy if, the, you, know, if you lifted the object to a higher location, then it could fall down further distance and gain more kinetic energy as it falls. So obviously, a high, as you go higher up uh, towards the sky, then the object in question is going to have more gravitational potential energy. And so what would, obviously gravitational potential energy would be, it, since it's energy, it's going to be measured in joules. So electric fields, let's say for example we had an electric field. Now the thing about electric fields is, let's, let's give you a situation that is similar to this situation where you have you know the ground here and you're lifting something above the ground to a specific height and the the similarity there would be something where the E field would have to be constant why, why is that the case well because if you consider the surface of the earth right then G not, not big G, so that'd be little g, right, which is equal to 9.8 newtons per kilogram. That value is constant, at least, you know, for the surface of the Earth, right? We're not talking about, you know, uh, distances where they're planetary distances. So what type of, where would the E field be constant? So the answer to that is when you have parallel plates. So parallel plates are two metallic plates, right, conductive. And let's say you have uh, one positively charged and another one negatively charged. So in here, you're going to have high electric potential on this side, because this is positive, and lower electric potential on this side, because this is negative. So if you were to take a charge let's say for example obviously we, we in this case you know test charges are always positive right we have to remember that test charges are positive so if you put a test charge here this would be at a higher electric potential than say over here now, what, would that, what does that mean? That means if we let the charge go, so if we were holding it in this position here, if we let it go, then it would accelerate in that direction. It would be repelled by the, all these positives, and it would be attracted by all these negatives. So this is similar to the situation of having an object above the ground, because G is constant. Here, um, remember what is an electric field equal to, right? It's the amount of uh, force divided by charge. Notice the units here are force per unit mass. So these things are the same. This is the gravitational field strength. This is the electric field strength. Right, and so obviously it's going to have units newtons uh, per coulomb. So, what you need to remember in this situation is that these electric field lines in between the plates are evenly spaced because the electric field is constant, and the direction of the electric field is in this direction because it's for a positive test charge. And more importantly, the E field is constant in between the plates. This is an important fact. Because if we know what charge 
is placed between a parallel plate, then we can calculate the, sorry, let me say that again. Well, two things. In other words, if we know the electric field and the charge inside the parallel plates, we can then easily calculate the force, right? Take this equation and rewrite it, and you say F equals E times Q. Now we know the force that is on the charge in between the parallel plates. Now the Q isn't going to change, right? That's the charge that's in there. But also in between the parallel plates, the E, since it's constant, okay, since the E is constant, then the E isn't going to change either, which means that the force on this particle in between the parallel plates is going to remain constant throughout its journey from one side to the other. Okay? That's really important because now if you know that the force on the object is constant, well, now that's exactly the same situation as, let's say, for example, dropping a ball or a rock on the surface of the Earth. The force, in this case, which is mg, is going to be constant throughout the fall. And you can do a whole bunch of uh, kinematics and dynamics on this, which you've learned in Physics 11. And so it's exactly the same situation here for a parallel plate. Because once again, the force is constant because the E field is constant and the charge is the same. So um, we'll run into some questions later, uh, which will show this in further detail. Um, but what I want to really emphasize right now is that this is not the case for a point charge. So let me show you why this is different for a point charge. So if you have a, let's say, a positive Q here. So this is, let's make a new heading here, point charge. What does the E field look like? OK, so the E field lines are going to go like this. And you can even put some more of them if you wish. And they're all going to be pointing away, right? Because the, in, the charge at the center is going to be a positive Q. So that means you're going to have, you know, so, oops, you're going to have concentric spheres where your electric field strength is decreasing. So remember. Um, for a point charge, what does E equal? It's kq over r squared. This is not constant. So if I was to kind of like, you know, plot this as a graph, uh, you can forget the k and the q because those are just constants. But 1 over r squared means as you move away, then you have an inverse square law. And so roughly, you know, I've drawn an inverse square law here. But essentially, what it means is that as you move away from this center location where the Q is, your E field is going to drop. It goes, it goes down and down. So if this is your E field and this is your radius, as the radius increases, your E field gets smaller and smaller. So this is, n this is not constant. This E field is for a point charge. And of course, they're additive. I'm just talking about one point charge, not multiple point charges. But now, that means that the force on a charge, if we, you know, what's the force here? What's the force here? What's the force here? Well, guess what? It's not constant. It's changing, right? Because once again, this equation does hold F still equals EQ. But in this case, OK, so um, we don't have another test charge. So let's say we have a test charge here, right? Let's say this is our test charge. And we're moving it in this direction. Well, the, this is staying the same. Obviously, the test charge is uh, 
the same value, but the E field is decreasing, as you can see in this graph. That means the force is decreasing. Now, let's talk about work. So, what is work? Well, the basic definition of work that most students have learned in grade 11 is work equals force times distance. Um, this is, you know, this is the basic equation for work. And let's take a look at a graph and what this looks like. So usually what we have is we have F here and we have D here. And we have a constant force. For this equation to be valid, you need to have a constant force. And so we say, OK, well, if you m apply a force for a certain distance, then guess what? This area under the graph, which is actually simply multiplying the height of the graph by the width of the graph, and so it's, a, it's basically a rectangle. And the area of this rectangle is equal to, you guessed it, F times D. So essentially, the work done on an object by force F move distance D is simply F times D because F is constant. We're calculating the area here. But you see now, in this situation, where you have F and D for a point charge, now this is much different because now it's an inverse square law again. So the question now is, what's this area? Because now that, so in other words, if you move an object from, let's say, point, so let's say this is point you know, point A and this is point B. If you move it from here to here, what is the uh, work done? Well, this area is equal to the work done. But wait, we can't go F times D because it's not a rectangle anymore. So, uh-oh, guess what? I think we need calculus to do this, OK? Uh, I can't even spell calculus. So, but guess what? This is high school, uh, physics 12, and uh, we're not going to learn calculus to do this, although you can. But essentially, the calculus is already done for us. Hooray. So the calculus is actually hidden in a new equation, which states that W is equal to, and that's the work, delta V times Q. And I know this equation probably doesn't look like it has calculus hidden in it, but it does. And I'll tell you how it does. Delta V, so W is still work. So W is still equal to work. And the units of work is still a joule. Q. We know that's just charge already, and that's in coulombs. But now, what's, what's delta V? Well, delta V is equal to delta anything is always final minus initial. And please, this is not velocity, OK? I know it's, I'm using the same variable as velocity, the V, but it's not. So V stands for voltage, OK? And so now we have to ask ourselves, what is voltage? Let's take a look at the units to try and get a uh, kind of a clue as to what this is. So if you'll notice, right, if, if you solve this equation in this box here for V, you actually get delta V is equal to W over Q. That should give you a hint as to what it is, because now the units of this work out to be joules per coulomb. So in other words, one volt is equal to one joule per one coulomb. Now, we still haven't defined what voltage is, OK? So voltage is actually electric potential. Okay, 
And yes, it has units of joule per coulomb. So, but on its own, this equation, which by the way is a fantastic equation, um, how is that going to help us if we don't know what V is? Well, it turns out we kind of, we, we do have an equation for V, specifically for a point charge. So this, is, this, this equation for voltage is for point charges, okay? Sp and only specifically for, for point charges. And the equation is V is equal to K Q over R. So now, that is for a single point charge. Okay? And the cool thing about voltages, unlike electric fields, you can add them arithmetically. Arithmetically. Not vectorially. So we all know adding thing adding vectors is far more difficult than adding just plain old numbers. That's the beauty of voltage is if you have a conglomeration or you know like a whole bunch of charges, right? If you had, you know, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4 and so on, and you wanted to say, all right, um, what is the electric potential here? Well, now you don't have to use vectors anymore. You can just simply add these guys up all arithmetically. And that's, that's really nice, okay? Much simpler to do. So how does this all fit in? How does this all fit together? So, you know, essentially, what's this chapter, uh, electric potential, all about? So let me show you how this all works together. Essentially, we have, the, the crux of the issue is really we have two equations, okay? And the two equations are here. I'll, in fact, I'll even write them again. So this is the first equation here. I'll just put a box around it again. So there's the first one, and here's the second one, okay? Basically, that's it. Uh, so for, for this electric potential chapter, uh, those are, they, okay, they, there is another one, but you can, you can get that, you can derive the other one, but essentially, those are the two main important ones. Um, the other equation that I'm kind of referring to is let's go back to the parallel plate. And um, so where was that? So here is our parallel plate again. This equation work is equal to delta V times Q. This works for everything. Um, but let's also remember what work was equal to, remember from our old definition of work, work was equal to force times distance. Now this only works, this only works when F is constant. Constant. And, and it is constant in a parallel plate, only in a parallel plate. And that's because, right, because E is constant. We already went over this. But now look, if I take this equation and I solve for it, Solving for F, I'll say F equals E times Q. Just rearrange this equation here, right? F equals E times Q. So now I'm going to replace this F here with E times Q. So I'll say W equals E Q D. It doesn't matter which order you multiply them by. But essentially now what I have is the work done so, for example, let's say you have a parallel plate and you have a charge that goes from one side of the plate to the other. Then whatever this separation distance is, that's the little d, right? 
and the Q is the Q inside the parallel plates, and the E field is going to be given, okay? Uh, or you'll see later uh, there might be another way of finding E, but for now let's just say E is provided. Then we could figure out how much work was done on the charge to get it from one side to the other. So remember, this is very similar to, again, going back to gravitational analogy, having a mass fall to the ground. Because what we say now here is, yeah, work equals, uh, now usually the equation is written mgh, but I want you to understand something. Uh, what is mg? mg is the force of gravity times h, which is the distance. So there's the distance, right? And eq is f. So that's the same as e times q. So e is the same as g, and q is the same as m. I know it's multiplied in a different order, but I could just say this, and it would be the exact same, right? I could say it's g, which is the same as the e here, and then the Q, which is the same as the M, and the H is the same as the D. There you go. We all know this from grade 11, work is equal to MGH as it falls down. The question, how fast is the object going when it hits the ground? Oh, that's easy. We've done that before, right? We say, well, all the gravitational potential energy is converted, right? The gravitational p potential energy is converted into kinetic energy. Yeah, so all we say is we say, therefore, mgh is equal to 1 half mv squared. And then we can cancel out the m's, and we can calculate how fast it's going at the bottom by solving for v in this equation. This is physics 11. We've done this before. No problem. Guess what? It's exactly the same. Look at this. This is so cool. Now, Here's the cool thing about this. Right here, I'm going to cut a hole. Ready? Watch this. I'm going to use my eraser. Boom. I have now cut a hole in this parallel plate. Okay? So, I mean, you know, what do parallel plates look like uh, from a, a three-dimensional perspective, right? Three-dimensional perspective, a parallel plate would look kind of like this, like a plate. And then you'd have another plate, right? Uh, it's kind of going to close up the, the other side, so you're not going to see part of it, but you're not going to see the, the stuff underneath. But it's going to be looking from the side, right? They're just going to look like that. Two plates side by side with a separation distance in between them of D. So, yeah, that's the side view. But what, what I've done here is on one of them, I've made a hole, okay? So if I was to draw it again, I, I know I'm not great at drawing, but perhaps I could draw it like this. I'll draw the outside one first, and then I'll draw the inside one. Okay, so there it is. And then I put a hole here. See that? So essentially that is what I have here. Now, we say to ourselves, okay, well, if we know the E field, that's known, we know the charge inside, that's known, and we know the separation distance between the two plates, then we can easily calculate the work done on the charge simply by multiplying them all together. By the way, this only works for a parallel plate. But now, why is this special? Because we can then since we know it's E times Q times D, we can then set this equal to 1 half mv squared. And now we can calculate the velocity with which, that's a, that's a velocity V, with which the charge comes flying out the side of the parallel plates. And in fact, now, um, I don't know if you guys know what a cathode ray tube is, but it was what televisions looked like a long time ago. And you'd have like a, a cathode ray here, and then it would the, the television tube 
would kind of look like this. And you'd have your parallel plates back here, and you would accelerate electrons in the parallel, between the parallel plates, and it would come flying out. And then you'd have like a magnetic field here that would end up deflecting the electrons, and they would hit the surface of the screen. And if you were looking at it from this direction, uh, you'd see a, a picture, which is basically how a television would work. It would just, if the, if the front of the screen looks like this, the electron would paint a picture going back and forth and produce an image. And that's how old televisions worked. Um, so this technology was used for that type of an application along with others. However, let's go to the math now and let's take a look at how we would solve for the V. So in this case, you just simply take the 2 and put it on the other side. So you go 2 QED divided by M and then take the square root, and bingo bongo, you've got your velocity. So 2 times the electric field times the uh, charge multiplied by the distance of separation, d, between the two plates, divided by the mass of the particle, and you're going to know the, uh, the velocity with which the particle is ejected out over here on the other side. So that's a super uh, easy way to calculate the velocity that uh, parallel plate can produce. OK, so that's parallel plate. Let's now go back uh, to, and, and by the way, once again, don't try and memorize this. This isn't for memorizing, OK? Uh, you know, kinetic energy equals 1 half mv squared. This should already be, uh, that's like physics 11. Um, QED, how did, how did we get, sorry, EQD, how did we get that? Well, we just got that from the old physics 11 equation again, force times distance. And I know, so this equation, yes, okay? This equation I would memorize, E equals F over Q, or the same equation written a different way, F equals EQ. Um, from that, that's how I got this equation here. Okay, so it's easily derivable. You just simply substitute for f as I did earlier. Okay, um, now let's go back to the situation of uh, electric potential. Okay, so so far in that equation, in that uh, example of the parallel plate, we didn't talk about electric. Uh, potential or voltage. So how does this fit in? Well, let's give a different scenario now, okay? So maybe I'll just kind of move this over a little bit. We'll just have this equation here and we'll say, all right, here we have a positive test charge. Or no, sorry, not positive test charge, a positive charge, okay? Fixed positive charge. And then we'll say we have a small, also positive, charge here. And then we'll say, if we let go of this charge, obviously they're both positive, so they're going to repel. Let's say this charge, the big Q, is fixed. It's the big one. This little guy is going to move. Obviously, it's going to move in this direction. It's going to be repelled away. Question now is, if it moves a certain distance, let's say this is point A, and this is, let's say over here is point B, uh, how fast is it going to be going at point B? Ooh, this is kind of a similar question, except now the electric field is, as I said before, right? It's not going to be constant. The electric field is changing. Hmm. So this is where now this whole kind of chapter comes together. And here it is. Watch this. If I say W equals... Uh, it was um, delta V times Q. So this equation, yeah, this is, remember, this is one of the two equations you had to memorize. So this one was uh, KQ over R squared, and this was the other one. So now look, remember before, we could use the fact that the F was constant. Remember in the, over here, when we did this? We said work equals force times distance, and we just substituted for F. 
Well, we can't do that anymore. You know why? Because f is not constant. f is changing. We already discussed that. e is changing. But this equation is still valid. So now what we do is all we have to do is figure out, again, by the way, right, the uh, change in the kinetic energy, right, the work energy theorem is equal to the work done, just as we did before. Remember before I said here the work done, the kinetic energy and the work done were equal. Remember we had that before? Oh, yeah, it's up here. There it is. So we said the gravitational potential energy change in the kinetic energy. Whatever is lost by gravitational potential energy is gained by kinetic energy. Well, this equation basically says the same thing. Where am I? There it is. So the change in kinetic energy is equal to the work done. Same thing. In other words, if you can figure out what the work done is, then you can figure out, you can set that equal to 1 half mv squared. So let's say, for example, at this point, it starts at zero velocity. How fast is it going here? No problem. All you do is you say delta v times q equals 1 half mv squared. And now I can figure out what the velocity is at point b. The, the issue here now is that we need to figure out what delta v is. So that's the only thing that's left that we don't know. We know what the mass is. That'll be given. Okay. So if it's a, an electron or a proton, all those masses and stuff, those are just constants. Uh, those, can, those will always be provided. Um, and we know the charge of whatever it is. That'll be given too. But how do we calculate the v here? Well, let's just do the math here. And so very similar to before, we'll just say v is equal to 2 times delta v times q, right? Put the 2 up on the other side and divide by the m. And then you take the square root. And there you go. Again, don't memorize this, OK? Don't even memorize this. The only one you need to memorize is this one. So um, you can simply figure this out. It's very simple to, to work out very quickly. But we still need to figure out what delta v is. And that is where this equation comes in. Ta-da! Now, to calculate delta v, so let's say this is v at a and this is v at b. So what is v at a? Well, it's kq, and that's the big q, by the way, not the little q. Okay, um, divided by r, the distance from here to here. Okay, so that's let's say that's r a. Okay, and then you'd have that value. Then you'd have to calculate uh, v b. That's k q, same q, same q. k is just a constant. Nine times ten to the nine. Q is going to be whatever this is, and that'll be that'll be given in a question, and then divided by R B. Now, what's delta V? Well, it's remember it's final minus initial. So where does it end up finally? Here at B. So it's going to be V B minus V A. Remember I said before, delta is always final minus initial. This is the final location. This was the original initial location. So it's b minus a. So now, if we were to take these two values and we can put them in and we can say kq all over rb minus kq all over ra, to do ta-da, you've got delta v. And once you have delta v, you can stick this value into here and voila, you have figured out the velocity. Uh, from before. But that's, that's basically what you do. Now, the one added complication that I will tell you is that this example that I, sorry for keep moving the screen here, but this example that I went over is simply for one Q. So how can it get more complicated? I'll tell you. It may get more complicated if you have two. So Let's say, for example, we have um, a charge here. Let's call this um, Q1. 
And let's say we have another charge here. Call this Q2. Now we're going to have a small charge here, little q, and we're going to move it from point A. So now th let's just make this positive and let's make this positive just to keep things simple. So they're both going to repel the little q, right? And so now uh, that's point A, and let's say this is point B. So if this particle was to go from here to there, and if it starts off at A here, if the, you know, if the velocity here is, that's not voltage, okay, so that's velocity was zero, what's the velocity at this point? Hmm, so in order to solve a problem like this, it's the same thing again. You'll say W equals delta V times Q. So, so and then of course, obviously, then you could set that equal to uh, your, the, the change, right, in the kinetic energy. And since my initial kinetic energy is zero, I can just say, okay, that's just one half mv squared. So fine and dandy, done. The complication, however, here comes in the calculation of delta v. Because once again, delta v is equal to final position, that's b, minus initial position, that's position a. However, and this is the cool part about electric potential or the equation for voltage. V is equal to kq over r, right? But what is, the, what is VA and what is VB? So in this case, VA is going to equal. Are you ready for this? It's going to be equal to kqa all over, now, here's where the distances matter, okay? So we're at this point here, and oops, I shouldn't have put A there. Hold on, let me fix that. Okay, so that should have been uh, a 1. Let's just get rid of the eraser here. There. So, so that we're dealing with this guy right now. So KQ1 VA is KQ1 all over, now what's this distance? So this distance, let's say, is um, R1 uh, to A. R1A. Okay? But then, wait, the electric potential at point A is not just due to Q1, it's also due to Q2. And remember, I can add these arithmetically. That was the advantage of this. So now I can go plus KQ2 over R. Now, what's the distance between now here and here? Right? This one was R1A. This one's going to be R from 2 to A. And so that is the total voltage at point A. Now wait, that means we've only calculated this guy. Oh, we got to do this again for VB. See how it gets a little bit more complicated? Now, in high school physics, you're not going to have more than two charges. Okay, like, I mean, can you imagine if there was four charges? Wow, that would be a lot of work. Um, but essentially now, for VB, now we are going to have this distance. Let's call that R1B. OK, so that would be KQ1R1B plus KQ2 all over, now what's that distance? That's this distance here. So this would be R2B. Uh, OK, R2B. And so now you would add up these guys and you would get some value for VA and you would add up these two guys and you'd get some value for VB then you'd have to subtract them and once you subtract them then you you're able to calculate Delta V and once you have Delta V 
lo and behold, well actually we can just all do it again right here, right? Once you have delta V, you've got delta V times Q is equal to one half MV squared, and boom. I mean, it, the question might not necessarily ask you voltage. It might just say how much energy uh, is required. Let's say, for example, it wouldn't be you wouldn't actually have to input energy to move it from A to B because it's going to want a positive test charge here is going to want to move by itself from A to B. Okay, but what if the question said like here's a typical question: What if you want to move a charge from point B to point A? Now, in that case, you're going to have to be pushing against these two charges. So in that case, you're going to end up having to do positive work. Okay? And so positive work uh, means that energy is required or work is required to move the charge. A negative work is surplus, meaning... Uh, so. For example, in this case, moving from here to here, it would produce us, uh, give us a negative work, which means we have surplus. Okay? Uh, which means it turns, it, you, can, you can just let go of it and it'll go by itself. And at the end, at point B, you'll have kinet uh, that potential energy will have turn turned into kinetic energy. And so essentially, then it, we're back to this equation again once we've calculated delta V. And then you can calculate whatever you want from that point. So that was kind of a review of uh, electric potential. Hope you enjoyed it.